Now there were two photographs of the head. Was this proof that the image was constructed by intelligent beings? Does this second photograph solve the mystery? Or is it only the beginning of an even larger puzzle? A puzzle that has one of its most important pieces found here on Earth. These two photographs, identified by their NASA frame numbers, 35A72, Orbit 35, Camera A, Frame 72, and 70A13, also contained considerable detail about the surrounding area, revealing several other images that investigators found as exciting as the mysterious face. About 10 miles away from the uh, face is a couple of pyramids. Uh, and the strange thing about those pyramids is uh, they're very regular shape. And in the corner of each corner, there appears to be a buttress. And uh, on close examination, the, the buttress itself is pyramid-shaped. This would be really, really remarkable to, for this to be a natural formation. This pyramid is now called the DNM Pyramid, after its discoverers, Di Pietro and Molinar. Could it be that we were actually beginning to see genuine scientific proof that an intelligent race of beings actually lived on the planet Mars? Science advisor and investigator Richard Hoagland has worked tirelessly to discover the whole truth about the mysterious Cydonia region. A member of our team at that time, Dr. Mark Carlotto, decided to use a three-dimensional modeling technique to image the face in 3D. This proved, once and for all, that in fact this was a 1,500 foot high, mile long sculpture of a humanoid face. But is it not still possible that all of these intriguing shapes are really nothing more than accidents of nature? That the researchers are simply letting their imaginations run away with them? Perhaps. Nevertheless, many intriguing questions are raised by the odd similarity between the image from the planet Mars and this ancient structure here on Earth. The most fascinating question being, does this image on the surface of another planet provide important clues to the origins of ancient structures on our world? Richard Hoagland's research team may have uncovered proof that one of our oldest relics was not built at the time nor by the people to whom it is routinely attributed. As I began consulting various references and looking into books and talking with colleagues about the various aspects of the project, such as a sketch done by Jim Shannon, one of our early artists, we began to realize that anthropologically there was something profound about this structure. Could the resemblance between the face at Cydonia and the Sphinx at Giza be just a mere coincidence? If not, does it prove once and for all that these great monuments were in fact built by an intelligent race with at least some things in common? Could it be that both of these ancient sculptures were made by the same race? Did the Egyptians, in fact, as we know them, create this effigy, the Great Sphinx of Egypt? A detailed 1991 survey by a team of eminent geologists and geophysicists headed by Dr. Robert Schock of Boston University has now determined that the Great Sphinx was built around 5000 B.C. rather than 2500 B.C. as previously thought. Dr. Schock contends that the Sphinx actually suffered water damage from fierce flooding in the area more than 2,500 years before the first Egyptian kingdom came into existence. That is, the Sphinx appears to be much, much more heavily weathered than we have any right to expect from only, quote, 5,000 years of desert weathering. The kind of weathering we see on the Sphinx is best explained by the action of running water. You need rain to get that degree of erosion, 12 feet of it in some places, and it hasn't rained like that in Egypt for perhaps 10 to maybe 15 or 20,000 years. Now that raises a wonderful problem, because this means that we are looking, probably, at a monumental work of art, created at a time when nobody else on planet Earth was capable of doing anything like that. There's no other contemporary civilization to pin it on. So, who did it? Could it be that both of these ancient sculptures share a common heritage? 
that the Sphinx was built by literal descendants of those who created the amazing face on Mars long ago. Who or what is the face intended to represent? The year 2001, according to Arthur C. Clarke and his now famous 2001 A Space Odyssey, was supposed to have been the year of great discovery. Did technology keep pace with the dream? A billion dollars was poured into a satellite called the Mars Observer. Will it give us the answers? It's been over 40 years since the United States accomplished the outstanding feat of landing a man on the moon. But for some as yet unknown reason, American manned space exploration has been all but junked. Instead of returning to the moon and building bases, or going on to Mars to find what's there, we're confined to low Earth orbit, operating essentially a trucking company called the Shuttle, while an entire solar system beckoned. How could the futures have been so wrong? In the same 40 years, technology has taken us from this to this. Communication technology has done away with the tether, while computers have opened up undreamed of possibilities, putting computer power at virtually everyone's fingertips. But today's space program uses essentially the same technology developed for the Apollo program 40 years ago. NASA's Sidonia discovery in 76, and it's now obvious 20 years suppression, had a profound if negative influence on the direction, if not the pace, of the entire space program. To those behind the program, the presence of a human face on the surface of a nearby planet immediately seemed to imply the chilling scene of alien intervention. Could that be the answer? Was the development of space technology deliberately impeded for fear of the discovery of alien artifacts? Or had somebody already decided the artifact had been found and they were simply implementing policy? Clear back in 1959, NASA had commissioned a study by the prestigious Brookings Institute titled innocuously, Proposed Studies on the Implications of Peaceful Space Activities for Human Affairs. Given all the activities surrounding the sudden appearance of dozens of UFO sightings over the preceding 10 years, it is perhaps not too surprising that this study included a remarkable section for the Times entitled, Implications of a Discovery of Extraterrestrial Life. In this section of the 264-page document, Brookings experts advise NASA that, quote, cosmologists and astronomers think it quite likely that there is intelligent life in many solar systems, and astonishingly concluded that, quote, artifacts left at some point in time by these life forms might possibly be discovered through our own space activities on the Moon, Mars, or Venus. They went on to point out, long before Arthur C. Clarke put words in the mouth of his futuristic space administrator, the grave potential for social dislocation and cultural shock should this be prematurely disclosed. In fact, they recommended strongly total suppression of this information. But the question still remained. Was this indeed an artifact or just an interesting anomaly? Hoagland and his team, which he now called the Mars Mission, attacked the work with vigor. The photographs had shown more than just the face. There were other structures nearby that seemed to suggest an artificial construction. Could there be an answer in the complex geometry the Mars Mission had begun to develop around these nearby structures? Maybe there's a connection. Maybe the face of Sidonia is half man, half something else. First, they copied the left half of the Cydonia head, made a mirror image of it, and pasted it onto the other side. The results were interesting, but inconclusive. However, when he tried the same thing with the right half, flipped it over, and matched it up on the left side, the result was a clear image of a lion. Are these merely strange optical illusions, or are they the key to understanding the real truth about a connection between Earth and Mars? Surely, it's still possible that mere coincidence could account for the seemingly mysterious connection. But what was needed was some sort of scientific proof. Here in southwest England, the man-made mountain of Silbury Hill has loomed over the horizon since time immemorial. Nearby is Avebury, another megalithic monument believed to be thousands of years old. 
with an eroding earthen wall preserving an inner circle of partially preserved ancient standing stones. The area also contains an amazing connection to the structures at Sidonia. The connection here was determined not by simple observation or even supposition, but was founded on the plain facts of geometry. The question was, what if these ancient monuments in England corresponded in size, shape, and dimension to a set of geometric features on a plain called Sidonia? What if Abury Circle in England was in fact intended to represent, to be an analog of the crater at Sidonia? And Silbury Hill, a few miles to the south, came to represent the Tholus as Sidonia on Mars. The angles and positions of these ancient features, including where the cliff would be, where the tetrahedral pyramid seems to lie, and this specific angle interconnecting them both, the infamous 19.5, all seem to match including the very size of Silbury Hill in terms of its exterior moat with reference to the Tholus. It was at this point that we began to worry less about the ultimate reality of the face on Mars and more about the meaning and the message of Sidonia. Who or what is the face intended to represent? And will it spur interest in further exploration of the Red Planet? Or is it the death blow to the hopes of space scientists who have dreamed of one day walking on Mars.